So this is another advanced higher chemistry video and we are completing our set of videos on experimental determination of structure with a technique known as nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR. So NMR, as I just said, stands for nuclear magnetic resonance and um, it can be done for many, many, many different elements. But at advanced higher, you're going to specifically be looking at a proton NMR, so looking at only NMR for hydrogen atoms. And it allows you to identify the specific chemical environments of different protons. So whether or not a hydrogen is part of a methyl group or a hydroxyl group, a carboxyl group, whether it's attached to a double bond, etc. And you're going to be using page 17 of the data booklet in order to help you. And that's where all the NMR information is. And it is the final technique in allowing you to put together different parts of a molecule. Arguably, compared to all the other um, units or, or techniques, NMR is the one that can give you the most information just from one graph. So what is the theory behind NMR? So within a proton, the nucleus of a proton can be viewed as spinning on its axis. Um, and this, because it's positive charge and it's spinning, if you do physics, charges moving in circular motions produce an electromagnetic field. So the nucleus of any atom is a tiny magnet. If you then put atoms into an external magnetic field, so put a magnet inside a magnetic field, that magnet can either align itself with that external magnetic field or it can align against it. Most will align with the field um, and you would have to provide some energy in order to get it to flip against the magnetic field. And you can do this in NMR using radio waves. So again, it's another type of electromagnetic radiation. Again, you could be asked to calculate the energy using E equals HB. Um, and um, is radio waves cause this. So it is a very low value energy compared to all the other processes that we've looked at. So if we have an external magnetic field and we have our nucleus, is located in line with that field, we give it some energy in the form of a radio wave to get it to flip to a higher energy version where it is now pointing downwards, opposing the electromagnet, sorry, the external magnetic field. So you're just flipping it, you need to notice radio waves. Now, as the nucleus returns to normal, it will release energy. So it's going from an excited state because it had higher energy as it goes back to normal because it wants to be in line with the magnetic field because it's lower in energy, it will release a photon. If you detect these photons, um, you will then be able to put together a spectrum. And for every individual environment that the different protons within a molecule are finding, they will have slightly different energies and the quantity of that energy will be related to its environment. Therefore, by piecing together all these different energy environments, you can say what specific um, structure your compound will have. Now, the signals in a graph for NMR along the x-axis is something called the chemical shift. And they are measured in parts per million. So you don't have to understand where this parts per million comes from. You just need to know that it's called chemical shift. And just like um, infrared, the graph starts at a low value on the right hand side and it gets higher as you move to the left of the graph. And the value of the chemical shift correlates to a particular proton environment. As I said, page 17 allows you to identify specific types of protons. So it probably is good for you to, at this point, if you have not already got a data booklet in front of you, pause the video, get out your data booklet and start looking at page 17. So for example, um, from page 17, if you 
find that the chemical shift from your spectrum is between 4.5 and 6. That tells you that is from a proton found attached to a carbon-carbon double bond. And so the individual protons are always the ones in bold on the left-hand side of that uh, um, image on page 17. Now, every NMR has a signal at zero. You need to know that this is due to a chemical called TMS, trimethylsilane. Sorry, it's tetramethylsilane, tetramethylsilane, um, rather than trimethylsilane, and it is a reference. Now, you need a reference with NMR because every NMR machine, regardless of whether it's come from the same manufacturer, during the setup for it, there will be slight fluctuations in the magnetic field from one machine to another. So in order for the NMRs produced on one NMR machine to be comparable to another NMR machine, you need to use a reference and standardize everything against this reference. So tetramethylsilane is used as a reference and always put at position zero, and then everything done in comparison should fit on the exact chemical shifts as one another. So it is like a control um, reference. Now, more information we can get from NMR. So the first thing is that when we look at an NMR, it often just looks like a straight line signal. But if we zoom in, it's actually always a curve. And the area under that curve, done through integration, is proportional to the number of protons that are contributing towards that peak. So for example, if we had a signal for a carbon hydrogen, we should only see one um, value, one equivalent, sorry, for the area under the curve. If we also had a signal for a CH3 group, that CH3 signal should have three times the area under the curve as your CH group because it's for three protons. And so the integrated values for each peak give you the sort of ratio of how many protons are in that environment compared to another environment. So here we have an example of um, methylpropanoate. And we see the three curves, we see the three individual chemical shifts, which we could identify using um, the chart on page 17, but then the bracketed red numbers, that's our integrated values. And that tells us that we have one is a CH3, one is a CH2, and the other one is also a CH3. So that integrated value, which is often put in brackets, tells you the number of proton environments. The other thing to remember is that only unique environments give chemical shifts. So if a molecule is symmetrical, um, groups that are symmetrical to one another will appear as the exact same signal. So for example, in benzene, that molecule has a very high degree of symmetry, so much so that every proton, all six of them, are equivalent to one another. So you only see one signal on the NMR. Acetone is another good example. It's completely symmetrical down the middle. And so you only see one signal, even though there's two CH3 groups because they are related to one another. So here we've got some examples. Every proton environment should give a different signal. So how many environments for each one? Well, for that top one, uh, it's a skeletal formula. So we've got to remember that on the left and right hand side, we have CH3 groups. Those are symmetrical, so they're going to be the same. So we'd have one signal for the CH3 groups. We'll have one signal for the OH, but we'd also have one signal for the other hydrogen. So remember, this has only got four bonds, so there is another fourth hydrogen there. 
so we would see three unique signals. For this one on the bottom, if we're reading it, it goes CH3, CH, CH, CH2, CH3. That molecule has no symmetry, so we're going to see a unique signal for each type. So we're going to see five different signals in that one. So always watch out for symmetry. Symmetry reduces the number of signals. So far, every spectrum we've looked at has been what we would call a low resolution um, NMR. And that shows only one peak for each proton type. If you use high resolution, so this uses higher frequency radio waves and a higher, uh, larger external magnetic field, you can get much more detailed information about the proton environment. So low resolution tells you about the environment it's in individually. High resolution actually tells you about what groups are beside what other groups. So it allows a signal to be split based on how many protons are neighbouring it. And this leads us to something called the N plus one rule, which has been asked to be explained in previous past papers. What is the N plus one rule? Now, the N plus one rule is related to the fact that protons, if they are beside other protons, and I don't mean CH3, each hydrogen in a CH3 group um, having an effect on each other. I mean, if a CH3 group is beside a CH group, that CH will have an effect on the CH3, and the CH3 will have an effect on the CH. Uh, for every one neighbour, your NMR signal will be divided into N plus one peaks. So for example, if you're beside a CH group, that's one proton, you will appear as two peaks, something we'd call a doublet. If you're beside a CH2 group, N plus one is three, so you will appear as a triplet. If you're beside a CH3 group, you'll be split into four signals, a quadruplet. So based on when you look at the signal, if it's a doublet, a triplet, or a quadruplet, or even something more complicated, you can work out what is neighbouring what other group. And if you're beside multiple groups, you'll be very complicated because so we're going to show this, the difference between low and high resolution for a molecule, and we're going to explain every single peak to help understand. So we've got ethanol. Looking at it, we can see on our NMR signal in low resolution and high resolution, we have got four signals. When we look at the molecule, we only have three types of proton. So we've got to remember that signal at zero is our tetramethylsilane, our TMS, our reference. You only need to remember the letter TMS. Right, now we're going to be looking at the other signals. Now, in our low resolution at the top, we can see that the relative area under the peak is 3. So that's automatically going to lead us to believe that it's going to be our CH3 group because we know the molecule. It's also a value between um, zero, it's around one. And if we look at the NMR table on page 17, that tells us that it is a, a CH group that's just bonded to another carbon. So that also leads us to believe that it would be that CH3, CH2. When we look at our high resolution, we can see that it's split into a triplet. It's split into a triplet, N plus one rule, if it's a triplet, that means there are two neighbouring protons. So using all that information together, we know that that must be our CH3 group. Looking along at our next signal, the relative area under the peak is one. It is a singlet, which means it does not have any neighbouring hydrogens. It's got a chemical shift of 1.8, 
which would indicate that it's either an alcohol group or that it is near a carbon-carbon double bond. Now, we know the molecule is ethanol, so it's going to be our OH group. Finally, we've got a signal, the relative area under the peak is 2, which leads us to believe it would be a CH2 group. In the high resolution, it's a quadruplet. N plus 1 rule, if it's a quadruplet, take 1 away. That means it's got 3 neighbours. Its chemical shift is around 3.8. Now, 3.8 tells us that it is hydrogens on a carbon next to an oxygen. So it's either an ether or an alcohol, and that's where our CH2 group is. So that allows us to identify that. Now, one thing to be wary of, this was a relatively straightforward example because we knew what the molecule was and we were matching signals to the molecule. Often, when it comes to NMR, you don't have a molecule to look at and you have to interpret that data all together. Um, and what you need to do is write down all the bits of information that you have available. What's the relative area? What's the chemical shift? What is the multiplicity? What does that tell you about the number of hydrogens, the environment from the chemical shift, and its neighbours? And then once you've got all the bits of information written down, you can then try and draw a molecule. So it can be quite complicated. Sometimes you'll have the molecule and it'll just be a simple question. What would the multiplicity of that be? What would the chemical shift of that be? Or I, uh, match the signal to the molecule, something like that. But it can be quite complicated as well if you're not given the molecule at the start. So when it comes to interpreting NMR, you have three things to do. Firstly, look at the chemical shift. You can use that matching to page 17 to determine what type of environment it is. Secondly, if you're given the integrated area under the peak, that tells you information about the relative number of protons. And finally, if it's high resolution and each signal is split into a multiplet, you can use the n plus 1 rule to work out the number of neighbouring protons. All of that together is what allows you to use NMR and it is a really powerful technique. So please make sure that you do practice questions on NMR. I know this is one of the longer videos in this section, but that's because NMR is really important.